Hello, uh, my name is Matt Coates. I'm a gastroenterologist and physician scientist at Penn State, and I'm here to talk to you about pain and fatigue and inflammatory bowel disease. To start, I have no disclosures to provide. During this presentation, we'll be talking about pain and fatigue and inflammatory bowel disease. And specifically, we'll take each of these topics separately to review some basic facts about each sy symptom. We'll also talk about updated methods of management uh, and, and some potential future treatments for these issues. So first of all, pain in IBD. Pain is an unpleasant sensory and or emotional experience frequently associated with real or potential damage to tissues in our body. It's very common in inflammatory bowel disease, even in patients who have inactive disease. Up to 50% of patients with so-called quiescent or inactive disease may experience pain. This number rises higher when we talk about patients who have active disease. Pain is important because it affects people in a lot of ways. It affects your quality of life, but also affects people's pocketbooks. It's the primary cause of millions of visits to healthcare providers, thousands of procedures, and millions if not billions of dollars in lost wages each year. There are many causes of pain in inflammatory bowel disease. The one we think about most often is intestinal inflammation, but there are other issues as well, including complications related to IBD, such as strictures, adhesions, or fistula, or fistulae, food-related problems, something called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or SIBO, abdominal wall pain, and neurological or psychological or stress-related issues. We'll tackle each of these in the next few slides. Aside from abdominal pain-related issues, there are extra-intestinal and extra-abdominal causes of pain that are very important in inflammatory bowel disease. When we talk about intestinal inflammation and its relationship to pain, this is one of the most frequent causes of the symptom in IBD. During periods of flares or active disease, a host of specialized chemicals are released in the body, in the intestine and otherwise, that are sensed by neurons and other structures within the gut. These structures relay information back up through the spinal cord into the brain where it's perceived as pain. Pain is a very useful thing because it warns the body that something is or could be wrong with it somewhere. Strictures, adhesions, fistulae, these are all complications that people can develop in the setting of inflammatory bowel disease. Strictures are narrowings in the bowel itself. Adhesions are uh, fibrous tissues that form outside of the bowel, either related to significant inflammation or prior surgeries. Both of these issues can make it difficult for food and other materials to pass through the intestines. And if they get bad enough, they can cause significant discomfort. Some uh, cases, in some cases of IBD, patients can develop fistulae. These are abnormal connections that can develop between different structures within the body. And for a variety of reasons, these can lead to not only pain, but infections and abnormal drainage. The foods we eat can also cause pain. At the present time, although the impact of diet is uh, not completely clear in its role with stimulating inflammation related to IBD, 
there are a variety of ways that the foods we eat can cause pain. Certain types of foods known as FODMAPs, which are poorly absorbed carbohydrates that we, we eat in a variety of foods, can cause excess gas and abdominal discomfort. We know that when patients develop abdominal pain, this symptom in and of itself can also change the way that they eat and can lead to a variety of nutritional complications. So even if you uh, don't get pain from the food itself, the pain can cause problems with the types of foods you, you're able to eat and tolerate. Small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO can also cause pain in IBD. This develops usually in the setting of an alteration in the anatomy or function of the intestines within your body, frequently as a result of surgery or serious inflammation or complications related to inflammatory bowel disease. In SIBO, bacteria develop in large concentrations in particular parts of the bowel where they can develop large volumes of gas that can lead to painful bloating and cramping. As I mentioned, IBD patients, particularly those with surgery in the past or strictures are at a little higher risk for this condition. Pain in the wall of the abdomen can also be an issue and this may be related to a variety of factors, sometimes trauma or being directly hit um, in the, the abdominal wall or having surgery uh, can lead to this. S just straining the muscles and or connective tissues in your abdominal wall can lead to problems. Particularly after surgeries, people can develop hernias or other complications, including abscesses, and over the long haul, other common causes of pain in the abdominal wall include nerve entrapment, where nerves coming through the wall of muscle and connective tissue within the abdomen can get squeezed and or irritated in a way that results in pain. There are also neurological, psychological, and stress-related causes of pain. Being under stress can cause any existing pain in the body to worsen, regardless of where it's coming from. The gut appears to be especially prone to this because of this so-called brain-gut connection. And it's not uncommon to see patients with IBD exhibit anxiety, depression, and or other psychiatric conditions that have the final impact of increasing pain even if they don't cause it themselves, these conditions are notorious for heightening people's perception of pain from the body. There's a condition known as visceral hypersensitivity where increased sensitivity of the nerves associated with the gut can make even normal sensations from the gut feel painful or at least uncomfortable. Outside of the causes of ab abdominal pain that I just mentioned, there are a variety of extra intestinal sources of pain. This includes eye pain, oral pain related to ulcers and otherwise, kidney stones, pain related to the skin or soft tissue underneath the skin, pain in the perineum, so just outside of the end of your colon, pain in the joints. In addition to those sources, it's important to consider acute or short-term and chronic or long-term sources of pain. There are a variety of potential sources of acute pain. In this case, we're defining that as pain lasting less than six months. Active inflammation is a common cause bowel obstruction, development of an abscess or an infection, perianal abscess, 
Visceral hypersensitivity disorders sometimes can do this. Side effects from medications and certainly extra intestinal symptoms like the ones I just mentioned. Chronic sources of pain or sources of pain lasting more than six months also can be derived from persistent active inflammation in the gut, a buildup of scar tissue in the valve leading to strictures and other complications, inflammation in your joints, visceral hypersensitivity disorders, and nerve pain after surgery, such as the nerve entrapment I mentioned before. How do we manage these types of pain? Well, there are a variety of things that IBD providers do and that patients experiencing pain can do to help appropriately address the symptom. First and foremost, it's important to ensure that the inflammatory bowel disease itself is under control. This may require further testing and or modification of inflammatory bowel disease medications. Sometimes it's important and necessary to consider surgery in these cases, particularly when certain complications such as strictures, fistulae and or abscesses are involved. If the IBD is inactive, however, it's also important to work with your provider to identify other potential sources of pain. And usually this requires a multi-specialty approach. So bringing in a variety of different medical specialists to address different potential contributors. So how do we do that? Well, there are a variety of potential contributors in this case, as I mentioned before. One important issue relates to diet. It's important to monitor what is being eaten and, and consumed in general, uh, in part to avoid potential disease-related complications, particularly if you were to have strictures that might, uh, uh, that might not tolerate poorly digested foods. Certain food groups, as I mentioned before, are also more likely to produce gas and or diarrhea, which themselves can lead to pain and discomfort. The example I mentioned previously were the FODMAPs, but there are also other potential foods uh, that can lead to these symptoms, uh, including dairy and, and other food groups. There are behavioral therapies that may be appropriate under some circumstances, and there are a variety of them. Sometimes cognitive behavioral therapy is appropriate. This is an approach that is designed to identify and change negative thought patterns and behaviors that contribute to psychiatric issues that may heighten or worsen abdominal pain or pain in general. The most best studied form of this is psychotherapy. And we know that this has the potential to improve quality of life in a variety of patients. There are other approaches as well, that could be considered as well. There's so-called gut-directed hypnotherapy. These are uh, carefully guided relaxation exercises to, that also are designed to help reduce pain sensations. There's a lot of evidence behind this approach in other conditions associated with chronic abdominal pain, in particular in irritable bowel syndrome. We're learning more about this and its potential use in IBD. And there's a lot of hope that this could help uh, IBD patients with pain a great deal in the future. There are a variety of providers that uh, can employ these approaches, including clinical psychologists, licensed clinical social workers and, and medical social workers, as well as licensed clinical professional counselors. When we're talking about abdominal wall issues, there are a variety of potential contributors and different specialists that may be able to help out. If it's determined that there are surgical complications driving or at least contributing to pain, so that's things like hernias, 
ostomy related issues or, or other problems, it's important to talk with uh, surgeons to see if there are repair or revision options available. As I mentioned before, abdominal wall nerves can become entrapped in scars uh, and otherwise after surgeries. Sometimes in these cases, it's helpful to work with anesthesia pain specialists who can employ trigger point injection of uh, anesthetics to provide both uh, pain relief and diagnostic assistance in determining where the pain is coming from. Sometimes just as a result of chronic pain in particular, people can develop muscle strains. And so with the guidance of physical therapists and other providers, and sometimes just with rest and strengthening exercises, these types of issues can be really significantly improved. There are a variety of medications that IBD providers employ for managing pain. One of those medications are the steroids. Corticosteroids are designed to suppress the entire immune response in the body. And they can be very helpful for controlling inflammation related to an IBD flare. Unfortunately, they are associated with many long-term side effects, including the ones listed here. As a result of that, we usually like to keep patients on these medications for as brief a period as, as is necessary. Sometimes we use antispasmodics. These can be very helpful for relieving spasms in the bowel related either to inflammation, bowel obstructions, or other problems in the setting of IBD. They can be associated with side effects, including dry mouth, urinary retention, drowsiness, or even an increased heart rate or, or blurred vision. Sometimes people employ non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, such as NSAIDs, or, or otherwise known as NSAIDs. These can be very effective for non-gastrointestinal pain management, including for joint pain. Generally speaking, we try to avoid these medications in regular or large amounts in the setting of IBD because they can either damage the gastrointestinal tract and or potentially mimic problems related to inflammatory bowel disease. Sometimes they can even lead to symptoms, including abdominal pain. The so-called serotonin reuptake inhibitors and serotonin noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs and SNRIs are specifically designed to affect special chemical messengers that are commonly employed through neurons in the body. They increase serotonin and noradrenaline, which are uh, Hormones that can help reduce symptoms of depression and anxiety, in turn, affecting pain perception. Generally speaking, they're considered to be safer to use with a variety of other medications. But as with all medications, they have potential side effects too, including bowel habit changes. Tricyclic antidepressants or TCAs work similarly to SSRIs and SNRIs and can be taken at relatively low doses. They appear to have an impact on pain and can help with sleep in the setting of IBD. They too have their own side effects, including affecting the blood pressure, sweating, and other issues. Another important class of pain medications are the opioids and narcotics in general. We do not recommend use of opioids as a primary pain management option in IBD. That's because they're associated with a variety of serious side effects, 
potentially including even infection or death. And they can cause a host of digestive issues, such as constipation, nausea, vomiting, or even narcotic bowel syndrome, a condition that can, ironically enough, lead to more abdominal pain. They also have the potential for psychological and physical dependence. And because of these risks, we try to avoid them when at all possible. Unfortunately, they're still commonly employed, particularly in the emergency room and hospital settings. Although there may be appropriate times for their use, in most cases, it's best to avoid them. And we ask that IBD patients who are provided or uh, at risk of starting these, talk to their regular IBD providers to make sure that they don't have other options to use. There are a number of complementary therapies that can be employed, including acupuncture. And although we don't quite yet have concrete evidence to show an impact on abdominal pain, acupuncture has been proven to be helpful with pain and other symptoms in a variety of conditions, including IBD. Exercise and physical therapy may be useful for a variety of reasons, particularly for extra-intestinal sources of pain. As of now, there's conflicting evidence about the influence of these measures on abdominal pain. However, providers frequently use specialized physical therapists who may employ pelvic floor muscle training and abdominal manipulation to address painful symptoms or pelvic pain related to stooling. There is hope that light aerobic ex exercise and yoga and other related activities may help these symptoms and they've been shown to help improve quality of life. Medical cannabis and cannabinoid related therapies are being actively investigated now as potential pain and other symptom therapies. There is already evidence to show that they can help with pain and quality of life in IBD, though there is no current evidence for an impact on IBD inflammation. Stress management techniques are frequently employed in the setting of abdominal pain and other symptoms related to IBD. This includes mindfulness, meditation, and relaxation exercises, biofeedback, sleep hygiene, and use of support groups, incorporating individuals who've successfully addressed and managed similar symptoms in their own past. More information on all of these approaches can be provided at the link shown here on the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation website. How about fatigue in IBD? Well, fatigue is as important, if not more important than pain. Fatigue is an unrelenting sensation of having no energy or ability to employ uh, to engage in activities of daily living. It's twice as common in patients with IBD as compared to those without it. It affects IBD patients in clinical remission and in particular, those having a flare or active form of the disease. Generally speaking, it's considered to be more common in patients with Crohn's disease than ulcerative colitis but it's relatively common in both of these conditions. There are many causes of fatigue in IBD. Most prominently, we worry about inflammation. When a patient is having a flare of IBD, a variety of different inflammation-related signals are produced in the gut and elsewhere that can impact the brain 
and lead to the sensation of tiredness and lack of energy. It's relatively common for IBD patients to develop anemia or low red blood cell counts. This leads to reduced ability of the blood to deliver oxygen and other important substances to the body's tissue, which leads to feelings of weakness and fatigue. Micronutrient deficiencies are also common in this setting, including iron, vitamin B12, and folate deficiencies, all of which can contribute to these issues. Many medications can result in fatigue, including those that are prescribed specifically for IBD, such as azathioprine, 6-MP, and methotrexate. Steroids are usually considered to cause an increase in energy, at least early on, but over time, they're well known to cause insomnia, which in and of itself can lead to fatigue. They can also result in uh, symptoms of anxiety and or depression, which can, can lead to or affect feelings of fatigue. Antidepressants and narcotics, including opioids, can be associated with feeling tired and run down. Joint pains, and frankly, pains anywhere in the body that are commonly found in IBD patients can directly lead to feelings of fatigue. Sleep disturbances, either as a result of the symptoms mentioned above or directly related to the IBD itself are common and they can lead to fatigue and or other symptoms such as anxiety, depression that can worsen fatigue. So how is fatigue managed in this setting? There are a variety of ways that we try to address this. First and foremost, it's important for patients to work with their providers to try to identify potential causes of fatigue and other symptoms. It's common for IBD providers to ask patients to provide blood tests so that they can check for deficiencies of vitamins, minerals, and or cell counts that may be contributing to fatigue. Your IBD doctor should be reviewing your medication list at every visit and assessing for uh, the risk that any one or combination of these therapies may be contributing to your symptoms, including fatigue. If you're not sure whether or not a medication and or supplement or other consumable you're using may be contributing to these symptoms, it's important to mention this to your healthcare provider. Of course, IBD providers are always looking to ensure that their patients are on the most appropriate, safest therapies in the hopes of providing the best control of their underlying disease. Part of the choice for these medications is based on symptom control. And so if, again, if you are concerned that some of the symptoms you're experiencing may be related to your medications, please talk to your provider. In addition to the approaches described above, other commonly employed approaches that can be helpful for managing fatigue include low impact activities such as walking, biking, swimming, or yoga, utilization of cognitive behavioral therapy, and other complementary therapies such as relaxation and mindfulness exercises and hypnosis. Sleep hygiene is critically important in the context of fatigue. We generally recommend that patients limit their caffeine in the afternoon, particularly after 3 p.m., that they avoid naps during the day. 
do not use electronic devices, including computers, iPads, phones, just before going to bed, and that they try to go to bed and wake at the same time every day. Each of these interventions can have a huge impact on fatigue in, in the setting of IBD. Beyond what's mentioned above, it's important for patients to realize there are a lot of resources available in a variety of forms to help with symptom management, in particular with pain and fatigue. Providers will frequently help patients set short and long-term goals to help manage these issues, examples of which in the short term could include eliminating caffeine and naps to get a better night's rest to help address fatigue, or in the long term, adjusting medication regimens in the hope of reducing inflammation in the gut to help provide long-term relief of pain. Other examples include weaning off of potentially harmful medications such as opioids and transitioning to alternate safer methods of symptom management. Many of these things take time to work and so having patience in the setting is important. Engaging in effective uh, partnering with your healthcare team is critically important to meet any goals related to IBD management and management of the symptoms associated with IBD. Healthcare providers who specialize in IBD management are critical in being able to, to rule out a variety of potential causes of pain and fatigue. They're also part of a network that can be employed to connect the patients to appropriate other providers, such as pain management specialists, mental health professionals, and a host of other medical specialists who can address any variety of different symptoms that patients are experiencing. The bottom line is patients need to keep in mind that they're not alone. Many individuals with IBD suffer from both acute and chronic pain and or fatigue. There are ways to manage and cope with these symptoms. Keeping the following points in mind can be critical in achieving success in managing these symptoms. That includes sharing the, your pain and fatigue experience with your provider and participating in shared decision-making so that you receive the best possible care and treatment, engaging in coping skills and support programs, including other individuals who've been experiencing the same types of symptoms, and utilizing resources, resources such as the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation's IBD Help Center to learn more about these symptoms and the types of therapies and programs available to address them. The IBD Help Center is available uh, during the times listed. And there are a variety of community support programs and resources that can be found on the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation website. Thank you for your attention to this presentation.